first of all, an apology. Um, I've got my legs out. Uh, they're very pale and pasty. They've not been out at all this year, unlike my top half of my body, which is considerably different. Um, anyway, today, I think we're going to be looking at the potato experiment. There's some interesting updates there, I think, if you're interested in potato growing. Um, if you're not, it's incredibly boring. Um, anyway, I bought the notebook so we know what's what. A few things to look at around the garden. We may split this into two videos, I think. Um, yeah, there's a few interesting things to look at. We need to check the plants in the, in the polytunnel and generally um, see what on earth is going on up here. Um, right, let's crack on. These are what we call in the UK sweet peas. They're an ornamental flower that you uh, really do not want to be eating the seeds off. Not like regular garden peas. Um, these will make you very sick, but they smell absolutely delightful. So I should be picking those later and having them with my, uh, in my um, dining room. Sorry, I'm just slightly distracted. There's a chap over on the railway who's uh, felling a tree. And these are garden peas planted from the gutter. Grew them in that gutter and planted them out here last week. Um, honestly, I may not bother doing that again. Okay, so. Uh, I've got the book with me, with all the details for the potato experiment. Uh, you may occasionally hear a chainsaw. The chap over there with his high vis on, and uh, he's chopping down an ash tree on the railway. Don't know why he's chopping down an ash tree on the railway. It could be leaves on the line you know, for the few, for the autumn, um, or it might be that it's got ash dieback disease or some other reason. Anyway, uh, it's a job I used to do actually years ago, um, briefly. Around the southeast, but um, he's doing a really good job. He's working really quickly, so we'll crack on. That person's only up at the moment, so we'll crack on and um, see how the potatoes are getting on. We'll go through the notes of the book. If you hear a chainsaw, it's our friend over there. And if you've seen previous videos, you'll know that we call this pot top left, number one. And we work all the way through, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And this one is twelve. And uh, if you're a keen observer, you may be able to see the elephant in the room here. One of our pots has not been doing very well. This is pot seven, and it's the only pot out of the whole experiment which doesn't have a potato growing in it. Now, why is that? Let's consult the book and see if we can work it out. Pot seven is garden soil, GS, uh, and we've got two cut pieces. And this is the only one that I didn't... Um, I, I use cut pieces, I use whole potatoes in the rest. So does that mean anything? So is that conclusive proof that cutting your potatoes in half is a waste of time? No, it's not. Not by a long shot. I think the big problem here is that, well, A, this is not a proper science experiment. We would have had a lot more, so we, just losing one wouldn't have skewed the results. Um, we would have used all sorts of other scientific methods to do this scientifically. Now the thing, I think the problem here with the cut half potatoes is that this is the, just happened to be the one with garden soil, or one of the ones with garden soil. I know my garden soil here holds water quite well and we had an awful lot of rain in May and I think they've simply rotted off. Um, this one uh, next to it had very small potatoes and these were the ones that really struggled. 
both in garden soil. They both really struggled. Um, so is it conclusive proof that cutting your potatoes in half to make them go further is a waste of time? No, not by a long shot. So let's see uh, what the others are all done. And we'll just see if there's one other major difference I can see, um, which is interesting. So let's, let's just check what nutrients this row has this, in this direction. We know it's all garden soil in this direction. Um, uh, homemade compost in that next four. And in that four is shop ball. Um, but there's one over there, which I want to have a look at as well. In the shop bought soil. It's a little bit of a struggle to get in. This guy here is pot number nine, and pot number nine is a shop bought compost, um, and I've added 20 10 10, that's 20 parts nitrogen. Uh, 10 parts um, phosphorus and 10 parts potassium. Nitrogen makes the green parts of plants grow really strong, really quickly. It's what they use to, you know, in their cell division weather. Um, so this one, I'll bring you in a bit closer. So this guy here is the sort of control pot, so to speak. This is, uh, you can see my hand there, look. Um, a normal potato leaf grown in shop bought compost with no added nutrients whatsoever. Pretty bog standard type of plant. This guy here has got the 0045 sulfate of potash. He's got really quite small leaves and um, it's not all particularly green, it's not doing too badly. It's, it's, I'm sure it's you know, quite happy. Um, but hopefully he'll have huge tubers on. If we move here and we look at the leaves on this guy, look how big they are in comparison. That's too much nitrogen, well, not too much nitrogen, but um, I'm sure it's very happy to grow that big. But does that translate to bigger tubers? See the difference. Stands out as a sore thumb, doesn't it? Train driver agrees. Does nitrogen translate to bigger tubers? Tubers are a stem, aren't they? But it's not necessarily a green part of the plant. I still think the one behind us will end up doing better, the one with the sulfate of potash, because that should really be what helps it to lay down starch into a tuber. So we'll find out at the end of this experiment when we tip these out and weigh them we'll find out which did best but they're the two big differences at the moment cut potatoes over there in garden soil died the, the only cut potatoes i had possibly if they'd been in this much drier um this is really quite dry this soil i feel it if it'd been in this much drier shop bought compost maybe they would have thrived but i think Next year, maybe there's another experiment in the offing, isn't there? Of uh, cut halves versus whole potatoes. But in the moment, this nutrition slash um, growing medium experiment is showing these two big differences at the moment. Lots of nitrogen, big leaves, cut halves in garden soil, brown bread. Right. Okay, so that was a fairly quick video looking at... Um, the potato experiment you can see it's coming along nicely now just to round off i'm going to quickly look around at a few of the pests and diseases which are showing up on the plot um it was a very unusual year i'm sure you're all aware um february wasn't too bad i was hopeful if you've watched previous videos i was hopeful of a nice spring uh, we had a really pleasantly sunny april but with no rain and freezing temperatures at night big differences between day and night frost every morning really slow things up um, to the extent it even slowed up the pests 
didn't have any green flies show up until fairly recently. My strategy with pests is to kind of live and let live. If they get out of control, I'll try and use some kind of, you know, friendly or friendlier um, natural product to get rid of them, or a barrier like a net over my cabbages. Um, you can't always do that, and you have to resort sometimes to more drastic measures. In which case, I try for insects to get rid of insects. I would try and uh, use neem oil, which is from the uh, neem neem bee neem bean tree. Easy for you to say. I'll try it. Try it. neem bean tree. Okay, good. Um, anyway, they make an oil out of it. It um, interferes with the uh, life cycle of insects. It stops them feeding. And they start to death. Uh, totally natural product. They use it in all sorts of agriculture and equine applications. But of course, it's not discriminatory. It doesn't know the difference in a bee or an aphid or an ant or anything else. So um, if you go spraying it willy nilly over all your flowers and stuff, you're going to kill the bees too. You don't want to be killing the bees. The bees. Um, the honeybees and the bumblebees and the all the little carpenter bees and everything else, they all in their own way pollinate things for us. Which led me to start thinking about doing a quick whiz around now of pests. I don't know if I'll be able to find them all. There's a few beneficial insects and a few not so beneficial ones that have turned up. Funny, this year was a funny year because the ladybirds or ladybugs as they call them uh, in other parts of the English speaking world, and um, the ladybirds showed up really quite early before a lot of the aphids. Um, normally, you normally get the aphids, the ladybirds, other things. Blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, I'll have a quick look around, see what we can find. Might be interesting. Here's our first candidate. You can see this caterpillar here uh, on this plant, which is a mullion plant. It's a wild flower here in Europe and uh, in the UK, in Croydon. Um, and this one is covered with various generations of this mullion moth. Um, it will absolutely strip these leaves. As you can see, it's already done here. Um, honestly, mullion is an invasive plant in a lot of the world because um, they don't have this moth to keep it in check. I'm not too concerned at the moment. It's a pretty wild flower, uh, in my opinion. It's not an invasive plant in Europe, it's a native. And um, it's growing quite happily here at the allotment, quite a lot of it. And I've got nothing against these moths. I'd rather these moths ate this muddy and plant than anything else. Um, and while they've got their favorite food, that's what they'll be eating. So you carry on, fella. Another pest I have an awful lot of is mosquitoes. In my little wildlife tub pond here, um, is alive with the little wrigglers, the uh, baby mosquitoes. This side is much worse than the other side. But um, yes. So what I use for those is these pond donuts. We've got one left, being ample for both tubs. It's got a bacteria in it. Mm. Um, uh, mosquito larvae it kills them so not that I'm up here that much in the evenings but there's neighbors obviously in houses around that are so anything's the right thing to do to try and control this until such time that uh, I get an abundance of frogs that will eat these uh, little critters for me hopefully okay so let's do that half of this donut should be ample to do both baths I don't know if you can see them all. Can you see them all dancing in there? I don't know. Yeah, you can. Yes, mosquito larvae. Not one of man's favourites. So let's get this in. And we'll pop the other one in this side. So that will form a, a film of this bacteria. I believe they found it in a, a lake in Israel or somewhere. Um, but anyway, there'll be a 
this bacillus will um, put a little bacteria film along here. When the baby mosquitoes come up and try and breathe, they'll end up getting infected with it and it kills them off. So these water plants are looking quite nice. This, this pond doesn't look too bad. I'm not sure if there's any substantial wildlife in there, but um, it's not too bad. The other side is a bit of a, a festering pit. I don't know if you can see that little wasp there. So that looks like a parasitic wasp to me. It's definitely looking for somewhere to lay her eggs, I believe. And what does she want to lay her eggs in? And she'll be wanting to lay her eggs in aphids, I suspect. There's a few things on this, uh, on this plant. Various little beetles and weevils and things. This is the Astorian tree cabbage, which I want to try and save some seed from. Um, hopefully it doesn't just burst seed all over the garden and we have a forest of Astorian tree cabbage in the future. We shall see what happens. I use this net to keep uh, cabbages under control. Well, not cabbages under control, but the cabbage white butterfly under control. Again, it's a, not an unattractive butterfly really, but it will munch bunch all of my cabbages. One drawback with using a net like this, when you uh, have a net that's slightly too long, is you can end up with lots of slugs and snails finding a nice refuge. And they find their way under the net, they eat your cabbages, and the birds and stuff that would normally eat them can't follow them in there to munch bunch and predate them. So let's see if we can see any of those nasty creatures here. Oh, there we go. There's a snail, look, under that board. And here's his cousin, Mr. Slug, and some more of his brothers and sisters over here. And they love to hide under the net. And there's also red ants. Uh, that's not a great look either. They won't be happy with me disturbing this. And these little grey slugs are the worst ones. Oh, uh, camera's having trouble exposing on it because of the uh, dark net. There we go, he really is a problem. He will, if you've got bedding plants at home or something like that, and they've been devastated overnight, it'll be one of these fellas, guarantee it. His bigger cousin here, if I can find him. Okay, so I've got them side by side now. Yeah, this fella here, this little gray slug, he will devastate your bedding plants and your seedlings, everything else. And this guy here trying to run away um, he's a much bigger um, cousin. They generally eat dead plant matter, but he will have a go at your cabbages. And uh, I normally try and get rid of these by mechanical means. If you use your imagination, I won't show you that on camera because that would be uh, triggering for some people, I'm sure. In the middle of the frame is black fly being farmed by red ants. Red ants in the UK um, will give you a little nip. It's not the end of the world, but they will give you a little bite. That's not the most comfortable thing to get involved with. Um, and they're farming those aphids for the honeydew, which is uh, basically aphid poo. The aphids just tap into the plant and they let the flow of sap go straight through them, taking out as much sugar as they can and the rest comes out the back. Uh, ants collect that up, that sugary sap, and they take it back to their nest to feed their babies. <laughs> 